I think this case is not is, is not that because it's not saying every time every case of Birchus Kohanim you don't have to worry about the requirement of Amita. You know, you still are saying that there are certain circumstances in which, and this tshuva addresses the EF shah. So it's true, it's, it's the entire category of the tshuva, but it's not the entire category of the halacha. Yes? I'm not sure if it's what Leo was trying to ask, but um, I think my question, whether or not Leo was also asking it, is yes. kind of applying Shat of Tchach twice. First, the Shru Yaakov applied Shat of Tchach to align his fire. Now we'll apply Shat of Tchach again to align the Shru Yaakov. Um, okay, it's, that's true. That is true. Um, well, I don't know if he's Dafka Shasat Chak or it's more Mako Kiev Shah, but you are right. And that sort of also goes back to the point that Rabbi Clapper was making. You're sort of making it even more of a Bidievan in terms of that approach. Um, okay, I want to say one more thing about this, and then I want to get on to the uh, other approaches. Um, so the other thing I do want to say about this is the Taz, which does, did, at least at the face of it, could be used as an argument. You know, Taz is a better authority if he's saying it than the Shvus Yaakov, which everybody is yelling at. Um, and the Taz asks this question about the about the issues in Tanis versus the issues in Sota, and is the Hekesh Ravoda de Arais or de Rabbanon? And uh, it's funny, it sounds like he's discovered this question, um, but okay. And the end, he, when he's giving his answer, here's what he says at the end of Sifkat Tet Zion. He says, um, he wants to know why are Bali Mumun not excluded if we take the Hekesh for Shere seriously. Because it's Aaron Ubanav, all of Banav. So now, it's, okay, Shavis is serious, but there's a particular Pasuk that overrides and includes Bali Mumun. The Yesh Khan base Psulim, but he doesn't just say that, there's a Pasuk that includes it. Now he's going to explain who is really excluded biblically and who's not. So now he said basically what's the category that is that is that is uh, not Del Raisa excluded when the problem is where? What? Right, we're meaning it's in the Gavra. When it's about the person, then it's Aaron Ubanav, we're more inclusive in terms of the issue about the person. Where if it's about the act, then he's saying, then that, that's what we're going to have certain demands about the act. So, so far it's like we've been saying, and no basis to be more inclusive. But then he continues and he says the following. He says, um, the lo, so, the lo baha hekesh de bracha l'sheris ele b'davashu b'yad hadam, he go yoshe. And therefore, Aaron, the Bnei Aaron is coming to be inclusive of that, because that's something you can't change. So all of a sudden, he introduces this language of can you control it or not control it. Um, and, you know, and therefore, this is why the Shus Yaakov wanted to basically say, look, based on the Taz, but the it's not a problem, because the Taz says, I mean, he worked it into his whole Torah about Hekesh, but the bottom line is, the Taz says that the things that we're really excluding are the things that biyado the Takna. And by framing, emphasizing the biyado and not emphasizing the difference between the Mas and the Gav. Okay, now, it doesn't seem to me necessarily that that's, psh- uh, not necessarily, it doesn't seem to me that's Pshat of the Taz. To me, I think the Taz really is getting to what we said before, not whether you can or cannot control it, but whether it's Begavra or whether it's in terms of the act. But nevertheless, I want to ask you something about this, which gets to the heart of what we're discussing. So we've been saying so far that what is clearly Doraisa is the act, and what's Dorabanan and more included, okay, Dorabanan has problems, but Doraisa fundamentally included are things about the Gavra which we learn out from, B'nai, according to the Taz, from B'nai Aaron, all B'nai Aaron. What is the story about somebody who's wheelchair-bound, not able to stand, right? Where's the problem? Is the problem in the act, or is the problem in the Gavra? I mean, to some degree, obviously, it's both, right? But it's also acknowledging that it's not just a certain person not doing a particular type of an act. That's the problem. You didn't do the act of standing. The actual problem is, is that you are, as a person, are in a different state, and you're being right excluded. I'm sorry, you can't participate in this. So again, I'm not saying this solves the problem. If there's a requirement to stand in terms of the act, end of the day, this person isn't standing. But if you think about it conceptually, what the Taz just said is, he said, the requirements are about the act. Things that are about you as a person, 
like Baal Nun and so on, that were inclusive. B'nai Aaron tells us that all B'nai Aaron are included. Well, how about somebody that is as a person being excluded because they basically cannot walk, right? And this is now who they are, the Yavrit, not just temporary, right? And at the same time, they're also, at the same time, also because of that, not able to do a particular act. So it doesn't solve the problem. Bottom line is, he still hasn't done the act of standing, but it sort of pushes back against that. You acknowledge you haven't done the act, and at the same time, there's this idea that the Raisa, the Gemara went out of its way to include Bale Mumin, to include things that are more about the Gavra and less about the act. Um, so again, it doesn't solve the issue, but it sort of is, it creates, I think, an interesting type of attention. Okay, so now what do we have? Um, we have worked out the whole issue about saying Bidyeved, maybe will, will it be good or not. Um, we have talked about the Shvus Yaakov, about the weakness of the argument of the Shvus Yaakov, uh, but we talked about the question about the saying, okay, I don't agree with him, but is I this Mokhalov? How do you feel about that type of an approach? And we also looked at the last point I made about the Taz that could be read to be talking about just taking, oh, EF sharp, find your Yotze, which is how the Shvus Yaakov read it, and somebody could, maybe, if you wanted to get a source other than the Shvus Yaakov, I would advise Still, you know, focusing on the Taz and choosing to read Efshar and Efshar aspects of the Taz. But even if you don't read it that way, it creates an interesting tension thinking about the Gavra and the Maz. Okay, but that's one path not so successful. So now let's go to the other path. The other path is, okay, you did not, this person is not going to be Yodse Vidyevet. We're going to conclude that. What would be so bad about having this person get up and do the birchas koanim and say the psukim and uh, either not make the bracha or make the bracha or even so make the bracha? Is that a possibility? So the question then becomes, well, what is the story in general about doing a birchas koanim if you're not really doing the mitzvah? Are you, you know, are you, you know, are you yotze or are you not yotze? Uh, not yotze. You know, is that something that's problematic or not problematic? So um, here, I'm sorry, your name again. Yehuda said, maybe when it says Chod Zavarach, it means that, the, that it's an Isser to do it the other way. Okay, that would be like a Chiddush. You'd have to find a basis to say it's an Isser to do it the other way. Pshat is, is that what we're dealing with? Is that you're not Yotze. Okay, you're not Yotze. I'll say the Pesukim, but I won't be Yotze. I mean, when you're Slichos and you don't have a minion, you go ahead and you say the Yid Gimel Midos Shorachamim and you read them like Pesukim, you know, and sometimes if you're being good about it, you read it with a Tamim. Okay, so technically it's not the formal Kriya of Yud Gimel Midos, you know, but see more, but we can do it as reading Pesukim, as Kriya's Pesukim Ba'alma. We have some precedent to that. Nobody ever, it would be, you would have to have an argument to create an Isser to say those, to say it. Okay, so there's no Isser. Let's assume. Okay, however, where there is some interesting discussion, and this is the sort of Sefer HaChilukim that I mentioned, which is, there's a major debate, Rabbi Clapper, do you want to read the Sefer HaChilukim? Sefer HaChilukim is a work that you should totally be aware of. It is unclear who wrote it. It is a early Gaonic work, which records actual observed differences between practices in Eretz Yisrael and Bavel. It is not based on the book on the Bavli and Yerushalmi Gemaras. It's based on observed practices. It's obviously interesting to track to what degree does that reflect differences between the Bavli and the Yerushalmi. It's a very short list. I think there's about 30 or maybe 40 um, of them, and it's quite fascinating just as historical reading. And also there's an edition put out by Rav Ruvain Margoliot, which is the Rav Ruvain Margoliot edition in Hebrew books, Rabbi Clapper. Um, I think it's the, it's the right one, but I haven't, I haven't even found the right page. Okay, okay. anyway, he's got a great thing, because in the back, he does his sort of critical commentary, and he also discusses how the halacha continued to evolve afterwards, and puts it in a historical context. So one of the differences between Babel and Eretz Yisrael was about whether Shliach Tzibor, when there's no kohanim, says birchas kohanim. Do you have it there, Rabbi Klapper, or yeah. not? Ein Sham Kohanim, that's all. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, let's see which one it is. Chavtet. Yeah, so the text has a, has, a oh. whole, has a whole long thing. The one you want. No, no, no. Well, just the text itself. You're reading the piece of uh, the, the arrows. I think the first line he says what the what he actually he actually uh, yeah, me, No. One page, one page earlier, and then we'll find out. Now, the text is actually pretty long. Yeah, but no, the first line. The, these things are one line long. His arrows are very long. Mm. Uh, then I'm not. Okay. Anyway, in, in, in Eretz Yisrael, they would not have a shliach tzibor, a, a non kohen could not do birchas kohen. Whereas in Babel, if there were no kohen around, the shliach tzibor would sort of say it, which is our minhag, clearly. 
Um, so I thought that that was just sort of interesting as an indication that the issue, the concerns of if somebody isn't really doing it, is it still possible for them to sort of say the psukim, you know, does go back. But certainly the minute of the uh, of the minute of the Ashkenazim, as we know, is that the, you know is that the shliach tzibur uh, does the birchas kohanim on a very regular basis. We also don't say it except on yantav, um, and he does it even if he's not a kohen. But uh, the, what was interesting about that was that it's rooted in this concern of what does it mean for somebody to not do a real birchas kohanim and not even be a real kohen. Um, that I, means, I have language now if you want to. Yeah, what's the language? The language is well, the three different girsas. The, the right, yes. basic language is Be'er um, Yisrael ain't shleach tzibur in the verse birchas kohanim v'kahol shidorshin v'sam l'shemo b'shvil she'asr l'adam l'hasim et hashem elayim kainu kohen. Okay, so there you go. So, um, so I don't think that's the language of the Sefer Achilokim. I think that that's whatever. It doesn't matter. I think that's still part of his commentary. But the same, same point. That there's this idea that you have to do. If you're doing it, you got to do it real. Um, you know, and Ash- the Ashkenazim is obviously much more different. Of course, when the Ashkenazim do it and the Shiach Tzibur does it, he frames it as, I'm not giving you the bracha, I'm referring historically to, you know, God, you should bless them with the bracha of Bnei Aharon and so on. Um, now, this case is a little different. This person is a Kohen, he's just not doing it in technically the right way. It makes it even better, although what the uh, Pani Meira who argued on the Shavos Yaakov, you know, said the Shavos Yaakov tried to make an argument similar to that of the Masis Binyamin. Right? The Masis Binyamin, I think that this is very important in terms of the discourse, you know, is that says, says, how could, what often you find is that people that are, an approach that tries to be more inclusive or responsive or sensitive um, and therefore maybe have fewer restrictions is framed as the make approach. And then you're always on the defensive. Oh, if you're going to be make you know, you have to be able to defend that that's a legitimate cool. What the Masik Spinyamin does in his Jew on the Blind is very important, is he shifts, is he reframes the argument. He says, how... You know, what allows you to exclude people? What allows you to push people away from the Torah? You know, and you find this type of a language in, I think, a couple of contemporary posts, and you find it in Rabbi Vad Yosef when he deals with issues about, like, giving aliyot to people, you know, not Mechalei Shabbos, other types of issues. He says, you know, it's not just we should do it because it's important, it's makari them. There's also even the going around the attack. You know, how could somebody, you have it in um, uh, um, uh, Rav Yaakov Yechiel Weinberg in terms of women and bat, girls and bat mitzvah ceremonies. How could you exclude them? You're pushing them away from Torah, from Jewish community. I know you heard Shelley Cohen speak here before. And, you know, in the way I know what she speaks a lot, that was very true with me and my kids as well, is particularly in the area of disabilities. And this may be even, I think, more so in terms of, like, uh, um, sort of, um, um, uh, emotional behavioral, and not just not physical, is that you really feel rejected from the Jewish community, and a lot of people just want to just you know that's it. I'm giving up on the whole community. They don't have a place for me. I don't have any, you know I don't have a place for them. So we're not talking about a made-up argument. You know, feeling excluded because of who you are, you know, and excluded in so many different ways really can be a very powerful way that, that it pushes people away. So, you know, first of all, so you can frame things not, why do you frame it? Oh, you should go by me. It's a cool line. I know we normally, you know, you need, you know, you know, I, you know, I need, I, like, like, like I'm being mechadish something, but uh, and I'm on the defensive, but anyway, here's my argument, and I hope you'll rely on my cool line. You know, how about sort of saying it the other way? If the issue, and which works better if the, uh, you know, if it's sort of a more, uh, uh, if the sources are more equivocal, meaning or if the sources are more well-balanced, right, then you could say, what entitles you, if the sources speak equally in both directions, what entitles you to adopt a position that's going to exclude people? So uh, just, to, just adopting more inclusive things should not be seen as the weaker position. Nevertheless, if the sources are weaker, okay, then it might actually be weaker. Um, but that not because it's trying to be more inclusive and because it's not trying to put up as many barriers. So in a similar way, you had that the, um, that the uh, Shavus Yaakov said, tried to frame it as a chumrah. Here's this Kohen. How can you tell him not to, you know, you know, not to uh, give Birchas Kohen in? You're just going to be mevato, you know, the mitzvah says say Birchas Kohen. So yeah, how can you do that? So obviously he has to do it, which is like a pretty could be seen as like a silly argument because if you don't buy your whole your whole position your whole position, you know, um, then he's not being mevato any mitzvah says say. Um, so, so when the when it's responded to by the punning the eros, he basically makes that point. He says, first of all, that's silly because you know because if he's not yotze, he's not yotze, he's not being mevato anything. 
But then he goes further to make this point that we're dealing with, which is the issue about the problem of doing it, even if, you know, even just stop saying the psukim. And he says the line here is he says like this. He says, mm -hmm. let me find the right line. Or maybe it's in the other Yeah, where, where are you? The last part. On top of the year, from the years. The last part of the year. On top of... No, that's still... No, that's... Uh, no, no, that's the argument of the... It's Yaakov. I'm looking over the pushback against it. Hold on. Um... Oh yeah, so near the bottom of that page of the Pneumios, thank you, it says like this. Um, the key runs like four lines from the bottom. It says, the ink in Kivan Shabitibi Atosis Mephorish Shema Akim Didi Eve, the Abbe Kivu Lom Nistab a Klaub in Mitzuzu, Kishiri Yosei, the Adrava, Yesh Glavu Sha Over Beyase, the Mandam Rav Bizar, Hanosei Kapav, Over Beyase, Magin Avram Kasav Shekei Nikol Adina, so you're being over because you're a non-Kohen and you're doing this Yis Kapayim, Yosei Pasu Mitam Davik Moza, the Ingen Lama Lan Likana Is Beisur, Okay, so there we go. Not only is it you're not bad at not being over by not doing it, by doing it, you're risking being over a non kohen doing Birchas Kohanim, and this makes you like a non kohen. So, of course, that's a stretch because it A assumes that, that a non kohen is over on an essay, and B, that since we've been emphasizing that the problem here is the act and not the gavra, to be saying that makes him like a czar. But that reflects the attitude, which is. It's problematic to do it. If you're not being Yotze, maybe it's an Isser, maybe it certainly is problematic, and you should not be doing it if you're not actually being Yotze. Yes? The problem with that is Tosu and Kufa, in fact, the Reed himself is the one who seems to explicitly say that there's no Yotze of doing a uh, Bekakodian, even if you're a Zar. Right. And he's quoted by the Amatu. Right, Amatu. yeah, I think, I agree. I so think it's a very... It's particularly, I think, at least, yeah. I think it's actually based on each other, that the very fact that he doesn't think you did anything right. you without his qualifications, <laughs> Room, you say there's no Isa, it's just that you didn't do anything. Nothing right, happened. it doesn't even count as a Masa Birchus Kronik, which raises the question of is it was Birchus Kronik, you wasn't count. But I agree. I think it's hard to argue that there's technically a halakhic Isa, given the background about, you know, that we do say it as Ashkenazim, the non Kohen says it, although again we frame it in a particular way, but given, you know, that this whole argument, you have to really work hard to create a technical halakhic Isa. Nevertheless, you know, I think that there is certain, uh, there's two issues that still come up, which is a policy question, right? What does it mean to sort of go through a charade? You know, how do you sort of feel about that, like in the context of the show and so on? Um, and, you know, there's also the question about, like, the uh, Birch HaSamitzvah, right? The, the Birch HaSamitzvah issue. You know, the policy one, I think, is like, is two sided because, look, you know, there are really competing policies here. Um, um, on the one hand, um, you know, I'll give you another example. Where Moshe Feinstein speaks about, um, you know, discussing the issue about the uh, the Kala giving a ring to the Chassan after he's the Chassan does a ring. The Kodesh is saying the Kala gives a ring and says, "Harei Atam Kodesh." Moshe Feinstein says that uh, that it doesn't pass the Kiddushin because the Kiddushin was Kala the minute the Chassan gave the ring, but it's, you're totally not allowed to do it. Why not? Because he says you're completely misrepresenting Halacha. You're making it look like this is a, that this ritual and what the halachic act of kiddushin is is completely different from what it was. And you know, this is a point that I make, uh, you know, a lot. Um, you know, in general, when I talk about these issues, is, is that it's not just a question about the technical halachic aspect, you know, but it's also about representing halacha and sort of and representing that with integrity and not sort of pretending that something is halachic when it isn't. Um, you know, on the other, so that's a definitely a concern. Now there are different degrees, you know, about what it means to be shifting people's halachic 
you know, halachic types of perceptions um, about things. It's one thing creating a whole new ceremony, it's another thing having somebody participate in a birchas koanim, where also hopefully some people are a little bit understanding and sympathetic, and they also understand like maybe some types of, you know, pos positions of inclusion were made that might not technically be halacha. And the other thing is also they're competing, they're competing policy considerations, right? These issues about A, the issue of inclusion for this person, and B, if you want to think not just about the person but for the community, there's a policy about communicating the value and the importance of inclusion for the community. And I think that we don't think about that enough. I think that our modern orthodox shows tends to be very, you know, like, like it tends to sort of, uh, li we live in a bubble, and like we tend to pretend that everybody leaves this like these perfect lives, nobody's dealing with alcoholism or, di or divorce or abuse, and nobody has to deal with, you know, like we live in this little imaginary bubble, and anything that's sort of, that's disruptive to that, we don't want to sort of bring in and acknowledge. Um, and I do think that even in terms of a communal policy issue, to be, you know, that there's an important point to be made here. Um, it gets to this question, though, how do you balance that? Because the, is the message that the community gets, because, because of the importance of inclusion, because of the importance of having a more diverse community, we just throw halacha out the door? You know, or do they get the, or do they get the message that, no, we can allow somebody to do something because there's really not a halakh problem, even though it might look like, you know, it's specific, it, is a, it is a type of a beer has gone in, that's not really what's happening. And if you make that as a public announcement, that's not helping you so much on the inclusion front, right? Don't worry, when this person go gets the goes beer has gone in, we're not really, he's not really doing beer has gone in. So I do think that there are these sort of conflicting, um, conflicting values. I do think that what a rabbi can, or somebody can actually say is, if somebody gives them a hard time, like anybody who wants to understand this, you know, you know, um, you know is uh, welcome to come and speak to me, you know, or whatever, um, and sort of leave the door open for that conversation. But I do think, to me, my, my um, sympathies go out here in terms of allowing for this to happen. Um, and um, at least saying the psukim, I do think that people tend to, people tend to understand. Um, and people tend to like, not necessarily feel like that, like it's making a clear halachic statement and so on. It's usually like one or two troublemakers that want to make a ruckus. Everybody else, not necessarily think that they assume that it's completely a halachic thing, but they sort of, they, they have a certain sympathy and they have a certain understanding about what this is all, what this is all about. Um, that's in terms of, uh, what, what's that? so that's in terms, okay, so I want to get on to the issue about the bracha, but yes, questions. Well, okay, so there's just this other concern that comes up, I think, in that piece of also, which is, what if this person is then the only Kohen? So I guess you might say, right. oh, it's, so so what's the difference? If he weren't going to say it, then it would just be the Shalich who would say it, right. and who cares, it's the same thing. Right, so that's a good point, and that's why I wanted you to see the Pisgah Tshuvas, because the Pisgah Tshuvas, on the one hand, like, so far, here's the options that we have in front of us so far. What are the options we have? Option number one is, have him go up, do the Birchus Kroni with the Bracha, assume that he's Yod, say, like the, like the uh, Shrus Yaakov. Option number one. Option number two is, assume he's not Yod, say, and don't have him go up. Okay? Option number three is, have him go up and not make a Bracha. Okay, option number four might be have him go up and make a bracha, and we'll find some way to defend even making a bracha, even if we don't think he's the outside. Okay, then you get the option number five, which might not even have occurred to you, which is the position of the piskei tshuva, which is the, the what, what some people would call playing it safe, right? What's the piskei tshuva's option? It's the most completely uh, um, offensive possibility that you can imagine. What's the piskei tshuva's position on this? What should, what, what should happen in this case? What? Leave the show! Maybe the Shuas Yaakov is right, so you'll be over on an Asse if you stay around in show. But maybe, on the other hand, he's wrong, so we can't let you get an Aliyah, so you gotta leave the show. I do not know how anybody who had real, you know, was a really a posek who really dealt with real people could come to this type of a conclusion. Like, if you feel that he might be right, let the guy go up. And if you're so certain he's not right, then tell him he can stay in show. But say him actually leave the show. To me, this is like as a completely, uh, you know, it, it's what happens if you're a complete formalist, you're blocked away from real people, you think always about being, you'd say koha deo without the question about sort of the union card. And to me, it's like just such a completely intolerable position. But with all of that, what he also brings down is, if the, if the guy already started going up, then we could let him stay up and do the birchas koni without the bracha, unless he's the only one. So at least within that deeply offensive juva or whatever position that he quotes, he acknowledges that that it will be okay for him to do it with other people. Um, so you're asking me, what would I say if this guy was the only Kohen? Um, 
I think that that, that I would I would struggle with that one a lot more. I do think that that raises a lot more of those, like, of the question of also representing sort of a certain, you know, halachic integrity type of a position. Look, it's a general question also in terms of a show about how much you as a rabbi um, are seen or, or, you know, implicitly or um, in terms of sort of um, um, uh, saying that pastin halacha in terms of everything that's done by private individuals, right? So again, this comes up. Take another example, you know, a woman wearing a palace or wearing tefillin, you know, or, you know, in the woman's section. So do you have to say that I'm paskining that that's a l'chatchila thing to do um, in order to say that I feel that anyone who wants to do that has what to be somachan and I'm not going to feel that I have to for prevent it from happening, right? So if a Kohen decides to be Ola for birchas Kohanim, right, do I have to say, well, I do, do you know, do I have to say, look, you know, he, he, that's, that's not my decision, that's his decision. Again, I'm not sure that's the way to go here, because I think the point here is to be setting sort of certain standards and policies around the issues of inclusion, but I do think it does also sort of raise this question about the role you're exactly playing, the, the public role you're playing in these situations, as opposed to the, the sock for the particular individual and, you know, and his choice. Yes? I, I just want to suggest another option that might Help and inclusion without blowing your thoughts so much. What if we're not paid to make this person the Shliach Tzibo of the Big Hat Tony? That's a good chop. <laughs> that's that's, that's, that, that, that's yeah. cute. If it'll work, and then it'll work, it'll work every time, and it will, you know, again, right. You know, and does he. Again, it's sort of uh, it's constantly emphasizing his singled out status. So, right. you know, and he might not feel comfortable in that role, but I think it's, it's, a, ni it's a nice chop. Okay, but I did sort of want to at least raise those issues. Look, I do think the question about, A, it's not just for an individual, you know, how much is it sort of for the community what you're saying and a sock that's implicit for the community as opposed to what, how an individual is acting in your show. I do think there's the other issue, which is, you know, the question that you raised about, um, you know, about how much do we sort of see an implicit Easter in doing things, the, in, do, in doing it against this way that it's laid out? Or is Gemara just sort of saying that you're not being no thing? But again, there is there is what to rely on. I, I, I do sort of share what Leah said about sort of grappling more with the issue about when he's the only Kohen. I want to sort of start bringing this to a close. I know it's been going on uh, for a while, but I want to, I, 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 I want to make sure that I address one final thing about this, which is the, uh, or, or and then we'll talk briefly about the issue about redefining Amita, which is the issue of the Ra'avan. Because I think this is a very important shuva of on like, early German Rishon, very important shuva in terms of thinking about inclusion in general, um, and he specifically addresses the issue of a bracha. And I'll just sort of, sort of summarize it to you and then read a few lines. People, I think, are familiar with the Gemara that speaks about women um, are they doing smicha and korbanot, right? So, b'nei Yisrael somchos, and b'nei Yisrael somchos, you know, and then the tradition of Rabbi uh, Yudah, you know, uh, um, you know, that nothing somchos reshus. So, that's, you know, and then the Gemara, the, the, the Brighty even goes further to say that uh, there was a time that we brought ego shazif te shlomim lezros noshim, the somcho aleim, lo mitnei shmicha benoshim, ela, this is not smicha being a rabbi, this is the thing on the Quran, ela mitnei lasos nachas ruach lo for the sake of nachas ruach. And then the Gemara says, wow, why do you need to say nachas ruach? And why do you need to say any of that? If, uh, you know? No, first it says, one minute, how can you do smicha? Smicha b'kol kocho is avod of the kachim, it's asr. So if you're not really allowed, if it's not really obligated to do it, you shouldn't be allowed to. So it says, no, you sort of just did a, a light laying of the hands. You didn't really do kol kocho. So then the Gemara, so, uh, so, the, so, so then, you know, so, the, so then, the, so somehow the Gemara sort of comes to the conclusion that the white laying of the hands was somewhat problematic, but Kadei Lasus Nachas Ruach Lenoshim sort of makes it better. Yeah, I'll redo the key line in the Gemara. So it says, the Olam to be in the Kokoho, normally Smicha would be done the Kokoho, but Amalu Akfi Adaychu. But you said, like, lay your hands lightly. Ihachi, Lomit Nation, Yish Smicha Menachim, take the lay day in a Smicha class, not really Smicha. So I'm Rav Ami, okay. So they didn't do a real smicha, and it wasn't, and A, smicha, it really doesn't apply by women, B, it wasn't a real smicha, but it was kidei lasus nachas ruach. Okay, now one way of reading that was that when they were just lying their hands lightly, they weren't doing anything problematic. Um, it was just laying the hands lightly. And, uh, but why bother? Why bother bringing the korban to the other Oh, okay, so we want to make them feel included. We want to do kidei lasus nachas ruach. But a number of Rishonim read that differently. They actually read, Tosfos and this Ravon, they actually read that there's an Isra to do the laying of the hands, even not the Kokoho. 
And that Isser Drabanan would have been overridden for this concern of Kidei Lasas Nachas Ruach Lanashe. And that's the way the Ravan reads it. And from this, the Ravan comes to the following conclusion. The Ravan asks the question that all the Rishon Ashkenaz ask, which is, why do women make Birchas HaMitzvah, Ashkenazi women, on Mitzvah Sasei Shazman Grama, if they're not Mitzvah? So there's a lot of answers to that question. Probably the answer that we like best is that, um, you know, A, they're talking for Kla Yisrael, Sivanu, you know, love. Now, we women were Sivanu, but Kla Yisrael was Nitzvah. Say even a little sharper. Maybe you see women's exception from Mitzvah Sasei Shazman Grama as an exemption, fundamentally they're chayev, but they can choose to exempt themselves, you know? But if they're somehow fundamentally chayev, it's Ivanu is relevant. So these are some very nice answers in terms of Mr. Sasei Shazman Brahma. The Ravan says no. The Ravan says, you know what? You're right. It is a bracha levatal. Okay, it's a bracha levatal. But what? Why do women say it? Why do we let women say it? Any guesses? Kidei? Okay, it's an Israel Ravana. But you know what? For the sake of letting them be more included and feel more included because what else is nachas ruach in that gemara except feeling excluded religiously, right? So therefore, we allow it to override this drabanan concern. So if you take a look at the ravan, here's what he says. He says, "Mashenago avotein u'shelogim chos benoshim hanot los tula v'mevarchos alav v'chein leishim besuka mevarchos." So how do we do this? Nearly avotishim to wrote mitzvah sasei shazman from a heim. And he skips, I'll skip a little bit. Um, and he says like this. Um, the Akafa, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, six lines down, last three words on the line. The Akafa Asumidrabanan, Shalobishat Smicha, Xer Shul Yasabukal Kalcha. So there's an Isidrabanan. So the Dachi Reb Yossi Akafa he Isur Midirabanan Mik Minoshim. So for the sake of including women that will override this Isur Dirabanan, Avos Micha Bekol Kochol that's an Isur Diraisa. He Hechi to Dachi Reb Yossi Isur Dirabanan Mik Minoshim. Machanami Dachi Biachas Suka the Lula of the Leka the Isur Dirabanan Brachu Matala Mik Minoshim Umevarchi. Okay, so this is a very interesting position of the rabbi. Now here it makes it sound like lechatchila. At the end he gets in a little bit of, therefore we're not moche, we don't oppose it. But here the rabbi basically says, similar to the Kavod Brios, a type of thing overrides the Rabbanan. It is a very powerful rabbi to know in terms of any discussion about inclusion. For the sake of nachas ruach lenashim, which as I said, shatz means exactly this, feeling excluded at, not as an equal in this mitzvah, not able to make a bracha, not able to do smicha, we will override the rabbanan concerns. And even if the Gemara doesn't, it's not just the one thing that the Gemara said about doing smicha on a korban. It's uh, other things as well, bracha levatala, other rabbanan concerns we will override for the sake of this. Now, what is powerful about this is that it has very broad application. Application to potentially women's issues, application to issues of disabilities. Anytime you get a problem, you say, okay, but if the obstacles in our way are just isure durabanan, whether it's a brachel of atala, whether it's, who knows, I mean, so many things in our sort of religious life, particularly in the show life, are durabanans. Any type of thing that's just about a durabanan, you don't have to worry about it. You're going to go ahead and do this. So on one end, it's extremely powerful. On the other hand, number one is that uh, I don't know anybody who quotes the Ravan Mahalo. <laughs> I discovered this Ravan and I was so thrilled about the potential of it. But you'd have to find if anybody, you know, now with, I guess, Barilan, I, I, I do, do, do a search if anybody quotes this. But to my mind, I don't, but I, I don't know people who quote it. I certainly know it's not part of the general discourse. And number two becomes the question about sort of the, um, you know, is it a little patronizing? You know, is it like, okay, you're not really Yotze, you're not really this, but we'll let you go through this charade and we'll override these Rabbanans in order to make you feel better. It'll make you feel more included. Um, so, and that raises questions in general about a halachic process where the values that are sort of informing how you get to the conclusion are not necessarily of the ones that you would want to be embracing, but they get you where you need to go. Um, so, for example, like I think it was, um, what's his name, um, uh, Justice uh, uh, um, Brandeis, who said, um, who said, like, uh, you know, salami, they said, the law is like salami. If you enjoy it, you shouldn't see how it's made. 
Uh, so uh, it's also like the uh, like you know I mean Rav Moshe you know solves the whole Mamzerus issue with women that are married in conservative marriages without a get because oh you know they're all up because sin and therefore none of the weddings are kosher and therefore you don't need a get so it's, it's a wonderful <laughs> conclusion but then we, well, how much do we want to sort of be embracing all of the values that are implicit in it if you saw the movie Lincoln right there's a great scene where he talks about the legal basis on which the North freed the slaves that it captured during the Civil War it says how do we how do we feel the slaves, because we say that it's property captured by you know from a combatant nation, um, that therefore you know that we that that that, that legally becomes ours. It it's just one problem. The South isn't a combat isn't a combatant nation, and we don't believe that slaves are property. <laughs> but okay, that's what the argument we use in order to free the slaves that that, are, that were captured. So here, you know, is it is it problematic to be basing it all on nachas ruach? Yes. On the other hand, you could sort of see it as a certain type of a value statement. You know, the idea of religious inclusion within, you know, within ritual is an important one, and certain durabanans have to give way. Um, and you all, you know, and again, sometimes it might not exactly matter how you get there. Okay, so I think that this is interesting to be aware of in terms of its broad potential application. Although, again, I not don't know of anyone who really, uh, you know, uh, what voice this has in the halachic discourse. Yes, Leah. I, I don't have a lot of questions about this, but yes. Um, so the first one is. Like, who are the Rabbanan who are allowed to be overriding Rabbanan? Because if it's just Rabbanan themselves, i.e. like sort of USC or whatever, right. the people who are making the rules in the first place, I don't think it's patronizing. Then it's like, oh, we made a rule, we saw that it hurt people, and now we're changing the rule. Right. That, that doesn't seem problematic to me or patronizing. That seems to me like... Right, if the rule oh, is sorry, directly being changed, it's, 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 right. It's, 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 but I don't think like Brachel of Atala is saying there's no longer a problem of Brachel of Atala, right? So it does seem to occur at like a later stage. Right. There is this rule on the books, and now we're going to allow it to sort of, you know, it's sort of like the Cabrabrias argument. So, but, yeah. yeah. And then the, the, yeah. the other question was just about Bacha right? Yeah. Don't we often find Bacha to be Lotisala? So, there's a big difference between Ashkenazim and Sephardim. You know, Ashkenazim assume that that's all Asmachta and it's totally Durabanan. You know, Rav Avad Yosef is crazy about concerns of Brachel of Atala, um, and assumes that it's uh, much more in the, in the sort of the right or close to the right to category. But for Ashkenazim, we generally assume it's all the Rabban. Yes, question. Um, could we also say that even according to the Rabban, um, they they only allowed they only allowed them some Durabanans because of the Nakat Ruach, but only only in cases mentioned in the Gemara. So I, I specifically I specifically made the point that that's not the case. That the Gemara never discusses uh, Birchas and Mitzvah. He never tries to make the argument of it going back to the Gemara. He says, why do our women? Why do we let our women make Birchas and Mitzvah and Mitzvah say Shazman Gram? So he is not saying the, the specific Durabanans we find in the Gemara. He's extending it to cases that were not addressed in the Gemara. Maybe it was a student. Maybe it was a Masara from the Talmud. Uh, it doesn't sound that way. It says, Ki hechi dudachi reb yosi. The language is, the Ki hechi dudachi reb yosi sur darabonan. Hachi mani dachi. So you want to say the dachi is reb yosi is dachi. Um, no, I think he says dachi birchas the lekar le sur daran brachel batala. No, the birchas is sukkah is docha the brachel batala concern. I don't think so. He says, oh, well, maybe. You have Nagu Avosenu. He does start with Avosenu. He never yeah. tries to say that this is based on a Gemara, that the women, you know, with his, uh, no, that the Hilmi Hamaka is, no, no, no. But that's not an indication about making the bracha. That's just a question about what Rebbe Huda's position is. Um, it's interesting, you know. Maybe, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe the use of the word Avosenu, although I really think Avosenu just means it's an old Minagashkenaz. But uh, it, it's some ambiguity. He never clearly right. says, I'm going to argue that this was a position in the Gemara. But you, know, you are right. That it's one thing to adopt the Ravan, and then it's another right. thing. Even though the Ravan seems to state it as a general principle, it's right. another thing to then apply the Ravan you know, you know, very broadly. Yes, Rabbi Clapper. I just read the language of the Sefer Yashar. Yes. Which is, uh, He's Rabban. quoting the Ravan, or it's the Sefer Yashar? It's the Sefer Yashar. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know where the Sefer Yashar comes from. You know, that could be assembled from other places. Yeah. But, right. What? Kulhu Sharu. Kulhu Sharu. Which means that he's using, he uses the same language of Dachi, but he really is talking about whether you make the Zer in the first place or not. So he doesn't say Lo Machina. He says Kulhu Sharu. So okay. the language the Rabban. All right, but the Rabban, I think you have to work, take the Rabban on his own terms. I, mean, I think that's a methodological question. I mean, the Ravan clearly speaks about Dachi. In the end, the Ravan even says, I, you know, Lo Dachin, I mean, they I, I'm not the, oh, right. the right to be, I just put it out methodologically. When the language is coming, it's He's not necessarily quoting the Ravan. 
No, the other way around. No. I mean, the, the Ravon is 12th century. I don't know. Was yeah, what I don't know where the language comes from. Whose language is it? They might have been in, they might have been part of the discourse about Dahi, whatever, but I don't think, you know, I think you can take each source independently. I don't see any okay. reason to read one through the lens of the other. Um, I mean, if they're not quoting a third source, I don't see I don't see why I, we I should assume that. I okay, anyway, that. was there another question? No? Okay, so now yes. Um, so you've been assuming there is this value this Jewish value of inclusivity. I want to ask if that is, is that the case? And if so, where is it coming from? Right. So I didn't I was when I spoke to Trevor Clapper about the share I was gonna give, I said, Do you want me to talk about this sort of broad value and so on? He says, No, he says like that, you know, I want to talk about a very specific halacha topic. So I sort of like started with that assumption. Um, to some degree I'll address it tonight about the discussion of the gear. Okay. Um, I'm sort of you know, I'm starting with I mean, in a way, by the way, that talking about Nachas Ruach Lanashim could be seen exactly that. I mean to me, the shot, I, 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 to me, it's clear that the shot is what does it mean to feel excluded from equal participation in a religious ritual? And that doesn't mean that everybody will always feel that way, but when people are feeling that way, you know, there was a response to it. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of these issues about the Geri, Atom, Balana, and so on, now again, there's the technical halakhic aspect, and then there's sort of what you think are the broader values. Why, at the beginning of this year, I sort of pointed to that footnote in the Marei HaBazak, which I think is not, again, not making it as a halakhic argument, but pointing to sort of this larger thing. Well, even if you didn't want to say it as an intrinsic value, even if you just wanted to be pragmatic about it, right, it's the argument that the Masis Binyamin means. So we make, so we're trying to, we're pushing people away from Torah and mitzvahs. You know, what are the larger consequences of this too? You know, all of this sort of also comes with a practical cost, but I think the argument could be made beyond that. I want to end by, um, without looking at any more sources inside, just say one word about the last issue about the question of, um, of, uh, of defining Amida. So what you have in Halacha is what happens when people are sort of have crutches and prosthetics and so on. So in Hilchus Shabbos, we find that even if there's no Eber, if you're wearing, um, you know, if you're wear, if, if a person has a crutch or that he needs to walk, um, and there's some other side issues I don't want to get into about like maybe what if he doesn't totally need it, he can manage without it, concerns that he'll drop it, but fundamentally in terms of the issue of carrying, if a person has a crutch that, that, that he or she needs, or a prosthetic or whatever, totally allowed to walk on it with Shabbos without, uh, without an Abram. Now, I have to tell you something, just because it was personal for me, you know, that's not shot of the Gemara, I think that it's all based on the whole way, uh, there's a Tosos on a Mishnah on a Gemara that reads it that way, and that completely becomes accepted by Allah. But it's not necessarily so clear that that's where you would have come to from the Gemara. And there was a time uh, for, uh, about 20 years ago when I had a very serious uh, accident with a car and I was uh, multiple fractures and I was on crutches for like eight months. Um, and um, and A, so there was an Arab in the community, but of course I, didn't, I wasn't so much on the Arab. And this was, <laughs> and number two was, um, was uh, I know the, the halacha was, was that you can carry on it even without an Arab, but I wasn't so much on that halacha either, because I didn't feel it was part of the Gemara. So it may be helped that I didn't, that, that I'm not, that I'm not one of these people that totally needs to be in show or whatever. So <laughs> most of the time, either I wouldn't go to show on Shabbos, or I'd go like, I'd put my arms around and I'd like hop my way to show. But uh, I think my own thinking about halachic process and about how whether something is necessarily the push of of Gemara and how that what actually becomes halacha is the you know is not necessarily the pshat of the psukim or the pshat of the Gemara, but obviously has to do with how it's interpreted and how that that's been sort of the interpretations have been accepted and canonized, um, which is a separate you know discussion of what makes halacha. But anyway, for me this was very nogeal um, Anyway, so but that's the halacha. So that means. We see it as a chelak mehaguf. Uh, so, number one, not necessarily. Some postgim frame this not as a chelak mehaguf, but there's other things that you can have on Shabbos that isn't considered caring in addition to your body. What else? Your clothing. So maybe if it's something that you sort of, the crutch is clothing, clothing is normally something that's on you, not that sort of separate from you, but in some you do get the idea that it's, it's like a beget as opposed to a chelak mehaguf. Others do occasionally use the term of chelak mehaguf. Um, what, now, what happens when you go to Birchus Kohen? So there's a Shuvah of Rav Moshe where he discusses a Kohen with prosthetic legs. And his whole issue is the question about about mumim and is it distracting to people and you know that type of a concern he completely takes for granted that standing with prosthetic legs is considered to be standing okay that's completely taken for granted in the shuv and he allows him to do berchus kohen so the only remaining so the question is though okay but you know there's a bit of a difference in terms of the wheelchair and the prosthetic legs and there's two differences one is you can even make a difference in terms of arguing chelak mehaguf 
There's a cube of the heart, Svi, where he says, it's one thing when I'm actually using a crutch or, you know, to sort of, to propel myself and move myself, you can say that, like, you know, that, like, it's, it's, it's my legs are somehow incorporated into that process, as opposed to the wheelchair, there's no part of my body that's actually moving. I can say my arms are moving, but, you know, he feels that that's, like, too removed, that that's not actually seen as much as, your, as somebody's legs as with something like, cr like crutches, which are more integrated into the, you know, process of actual, of actual moving, you know, and part more of the action of your legs. Okay, that I'm going to bracket because that basically gets ignored. La Halacha is written in terms of Hilfus Shabbos. He's raising it in terms of Hilfus Shabbos. He's not sure that somebody in a wheelchair can even wheel themselves on Shabbos. Maybe it's not considered chenek mi haguf the same way crutches are. That is almost universally rejected, and um, people assume that you can go on, you know, somebody can certainly wheel themselves. The issue is about somebody else wheeling them, but somebody can actually wheel themselves. But I think the bigger question is, even if you're prepared to say chenek mi haguf, and even if you're prepared to say that that's true about a wheelchair as well, um, the question is, can you call it Amida? Right? And I think that that's sort of like the big question. Because, I mean, let's say I was doing, you know, this. I was doing Birchus Konim in a squat, right? Is that being Omeg? I'm not being Somech on anything. Presumably, that's Omeg, right? Even though, so, you know, but so how is that different from being in a wheelchair if you see that that's all part of my body? Well, I guess the difference is that being in a wheelchair, when I'm doing this, I'm still supporting myself with my leg muscles, right? My leg muscles are tensing in order to support me. When somebody's in a wheelchair, right, they don't need to be doing anything. You could be like asleep in a wheelchair, though some people can sleep standing up, but okay. You don't need to be doing anything to support your body in its current position. So it's harder to argue that it's Amida. Um, and we should admit that all the chuvot about wheelchairs, none of them assume that it constitutes Amida. I'm not the first person that knows the halach about wheelchairs on Shabbos and Chelech Miyaguf, but none of them assume that it actually constitutes Amida. So the question, though, is that, though, is that something to try to explore and to push down that path, you know, even though there's not good precedent for it, because going back to the earlier issue that I raised, the way in which it may be, number one, is more inclusive fundamentally, and number two, and here I want to tie back to the question that was raised before, is are we talking to the people with the disabilities and asking them, like, what to you, obviously you don't want, you, you want to be a l'chadchir or not a bit yevid, but I'm actually curious about if in this line of thinking we would stop and say to somebody, how do you relate to your wheelchair, you know? Do you see it as part of you? You know, or do you see it, you know, as not part of you? Do you feel, how do you relate to the whole concept of sitting and standing? What would it mean for you to sit and stand? Do you think you're always sitting? You know, do you think when you start the situation you want to be standing, you know, that, that because, you know, how do you, how do you relate to that? You know, and is that relevant in terms of thinking of this type of a question, which I really think gets an important issue of directly dealing with people, not just for the empathy aspect and the motivation aspect, but in terms of thinking about how are we going to halakhically define something, maybe sort of getting a first-person account about how these things sort of, you know, are experienced is relevant data. So for me personally, I would like to go down this path. But this path to me, although I need to speak to people, somebody in a wheelchair or people in wheelchairs and ask them how they feel about this, but to me, this, as I said, seems to be fundamentally more inclusive, right? It's not as... The, you know, everything until now had basically been, well, B'dievet, you're Yotze, say, even the Shavus Yaakov. And even the Shavus Yaakov's answer was very local to Birchus Kohen. This is something that's getting much more at the heart of the issue. And not only is it not saying that it's Lichat Chil as, as, as opposed to B'dievet, and not only is it more global, but what also it's doing is, is it's more in a way, um, you know, empowering, or maybe empowering is the wrong word, but it's more transformative in saying we're not, you know, we don't... There's, you know, we can see you more as a whole person and as somebody that fundamentally is not always in this dis disabled category if we're able to incorporate, you know, your new reality. So to me, there's something extremely attractive about this, but I have to admit that both conceptually, you know, to call it Amida is obviously a challenge, although, you know, I think that there's something to play with, but also really in terms of precedent, the implicit way wheelchair has been dealt with in all the true vote, you know, make it clear that all the, nobody else was has willing to consider this as Amida. They're all considering that it's not Amida. So I'm going to end, therefore, with laying out for you a menu of options and asking you sort of like, you know, which one you would consider doing. Okay, here are the possible options that we have. Number one is, um, um, don't, uh, well, let's start with the absolute worst. 
which is leave the show because we have to be machmir both ways. Um, that's option number one. Option number two is don't get up to do birchas kohanim because you know that's just the halacha and there's no way we can rely on any other position. Um, option number three is, you know, do it and rely on the Shavos Yaakov and Kedai Hu Yismav Shafat Chak and do it and make a bracha. Option number four is do it and not make a bracha because so far shall don't be your dasim psukim and at least we can sort of say we don't have to worry about we'll think through the policy issues but bottom line is the policy considerations are going to tip in the other way and so go ahead and say it and don't make don't make a bracha say it and make a bracha but we rely on the ravan that you can make a bracha even though it's not really birchas kohanim or you can go or let's think about or, or you can do it because we're going to consider this to actually be amida. So we have a whole range of possibilities. <laughs> so what would you sort of, what to you would sort of be, be influencing you in terms of how to choose between them? Now in honesty, you don't necessarily have to always choose between them, right? You could do a Rav Avagi Yosef. You could say, go ahead and do it with the bracha because either you got the Shrus Yaakov or you've got, you know, the bracha of Atali, if it's true, but you got the Ravon, you could also throw the cover of Rios, and maybe after we could start thinking about this as Amida, so with all of those combined, and so for Shildover, it's a Durabanon, you know, we could rely on one of those three. You don't have to choose between them. So you might not have to choose, okay? But I am curious to ask you, what would be the judgment call about making a choice between these types of options? I've been laying out some considerations. Kedai Lismochalov, policy considerations, something that's broadly applicable, like the Ravon, or considering it like Amida, as opposed to something that's narrowly applicable. Um, and I just want to sort of sort of put that out there, and I see already some hands up, because I think in the end, you know, you know, how mu- this, this is really the key question, and the final thing I'll say, and then take the responses, is, and how much does, again, the strict question of, you know, the, um, this gets back to the very first question that was raised, the most sort of the, the, the most uh, uh, intellectually honest read of the sources is that going to sort of you know be compl- like will that dominate in your thinking you know or how much do you know or how much is the, are there other things which doesn't mean that the psak always has to be with what, what I would say would be the absolute shot reading of, of, of all of these sources yes um, do you, as as I don't know, I don't know, if you were if you were a rabbi in a in this situation you have to make a specific policy, or could you just do it on a case by case, or would you feel comfortable doing it on a case by case basis? Because you could have one guy like coming in, like in the like in the question and thinking out about and saying, like, right. I'm, I'm having insomnia because I can't do very much right. brain. And then you would be, and then you might be more willing to rely on the Shri Yaakov, or you could have a guy right. come forward and say, I don't really care, I'm just in a wheelchair. And like this. Right, so I think that that's worth pointing out as one of the Nafkinas. You know, if you pass them like a Shri Yaakov and Bashas Adachak and so on, then you're going to want to judge every case individually. Right, but then you know again what that sort of does in terms of you know that tips in favor of like of trying to be uh, you know there's broader implications meaning it's not just the nafkamina well you don't need the psak so much but it also sort of more mm, mm, sort of frames everybody who you're postulating for as such an you know as a nebuch case which again undermines some of those values of of, of an approach of inclusion but you're right that definitely is you know is one way to go so yeah. I'm not sure why you assume that leaving the shul is the worst possible option. And it's only the worst possible option if you think that it, that it presumes that they're excluded from the community because they're doing it. I think if the, you can, I look, you're right. Maybe somebody will feel, if I'm not going to be giving Birchas Kohanim, then I'd rather not be here in shul. Okay? But I think that, to me, that that's why, again, you know, we shouldn't be having this conversation here. You know, you're right, I was totally speculating. We should have it with people who actually have to deal with this and ask them how they would feel about that. Um, but my intuition is, is that, you know, is that it's not enough, you know, that you're doing one exclusion, you're actually pushing me out of the shoal, and to me, my gut is, is that that is really the worst you could do. But uh, again, you're right, you have to, uh, I, 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 you know, you'd, ha- you'd have to speak to people and find out how they would feel about it. But that certainly is what my intuition is about that. Um, yeah, did you want to say? Yeah, I, just to put out another factor for consideration, you mentioned... Oh, in your final menu, yes. you didn't include all the other paths that you thought of intellectually. Mm-hmm. You saw the original sources that throughout the shoot you kind of discarded because no one mentioned it or, mm-hmm. or there's no precedent for them. Well, in a way, those sources I sort of saw as being reflected through the Shvus Yaakov. 
that was a possibility that some of these things weren't bidiyevet or they weren't derisa. So I basically saw the Shrus Yaakov as encompassing all Right, that. encompassing that and trying to hinge it on a Rambam. I, you know, but you're right, I didn't say that, let's just say, forget the Shrus Yaakov, forget the Rambam. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make the argument that it's Peshat in the Gemara. Mm -hmm. Right, so yes, I do think, you know, it sort of goes back to also my story of the crutches, I do think that Gemara, is halach is determined by what I think is Peshat in the Gemara. I think, you know, my read of the Gemara, you know, influences, you know, a lot of other sort of, you know, cheshbonot in terms of, well, you know, Rishon, with Rishonim and Akronim, I might be, you know, inclined to and tip towards and so on, and if there's something that is really, has not been discussed so far, and I haven't purchased to read, but again, that's not, we don't paskin straight from the Gemara based on my, you know, my personal read. So I do think that the way halachic process works is that, if all of the other things that preceded assume that Fidyev is not good, if I can't find someone like a Rambam, you know, to make the argument with, you know, then maybe it wouldn't have to be a Rambam. Maybe I could find another Ravon and say, okay, get who are Ravon, we smoke a lot, even though the Rambam is other. But yeah, that's the way the Allah process works. I need someone. But you wouldn't even put that in. Like, we talked about many factors that we're putting on the scale. You wouldn't yeah. add that as a factor? Is that, like, any less than Shas al Um, I will tell you this. If I thought that the Pshat of the Gemara was the other one, if I thought that the Pshat of the Gemara was that it's Bidyev and not Ma'akeh, then even though the Rambam and the Ri and all these other, and all the post games sort of say that it is Ma'akeh, to me, that might really sort of push me to, you know, to, you know, to find that, because that I think, you know, that I think is the halakhic process. The halakhic process is that earlier positions can be critiqued if it, you really can make, the, you know, a strong argument against it from the Gemara. But to actually argue against all the Rishonim and Achronim, you know, not to critique them, but because it's possible to say this in the Gemara, that I don't think, you know, holds